welcome to SAM Conversation, a video program of South Asia Monitor. I am Tarun Basu, and I am in conversation with two former ambassadors, South Asia experts, and if I might add, public intellectuals, Frank Wisner, who has served as UN ambassador to India in the 90s, and has closely followed the region since, both as a diplomat and as an international affairs consultant to top companies, the latest being Squire, Patton and Boggs, a global law firm. And we have Amit Dasgupta, an old friend who has served in the Indo-Pacific region from Philippines to Australia, and is now an educator and a consultant to one of the Australia's top universities, the University of New South Wales. Ambassador Wisna, so I'll go first with you. The world as we know it stands appended at war with an invisible enemy and not knowing what the future holds for any nation. The international order stands shaken by the unprecedented rise of China and challenges to the Westphalian model and what we should say new quasi alliances like Quad are reshaping international politics, which could possibly lead to the creation, which many fear, new security blocks. The accelerated US withdrawal from Afghanistan is giving the region new cause for headaches with the Taliban inching towards Kabul. The latest report says it may be just about 30 kilometers from Kabul. And this could reshape not just the half park region, but regional geopolitics as well and threaten India's security in a big way. As someone who knows this region well, Ambassador Visna, how do you see the future of India and South Asia in the light of current challenges, the expected vacuum in Afghanistan, and India beset with its own health challenges, which has badly affected not only 1.3 billion population, but the entire South Asia? Uh, first of all, I agree with you absolutely. We live in a time of change in global power, sole <clears throat> survivor of the Cold War and the preeminent international power. It shares its seat at the high table. And the <clears throat> emergence of other uh, significant and great powers will over time begin to take forms and shapes that we can't yet fully understand. Second, the world economics are changing absolutely in the most extraordinary way. Uh, we went through a period of what used to be called the Washington Consensus. I think we're headed back uh, from globalization to an adjusted form of globalization, which takes into account uh, onshoring secure uh, s supply lines, domestic production, so uh, a degree of protectionism. I'm not saying that all of this is good. I'm noting the tr transition. Third, I think we are in a time of fantastic scientific technological change. Biotechnology is going to be a transformative event in our lives, just as we've seen the emergence of vaccines uh, notably Pfizer and Moderna to deal with the current COVID uh, crisis in one year to produce a fundamentally new uh, biological intervention is quite unprecedented in world history and there is more to come. Fourth, we are facing a time of climate change, uh, an existential issue for the entire human race and the entire globe. Um, being recognized and gradually being dealt with, but the consequences, if we don't get on top of <clears throat> global warming are utterly catastrophic. Those four changes affect absolutely every one of us. As far as South Asia is concerned, you're not spared any of these changes. And I believe in terms of the United States, looking at it from my perspective, that the United States having to adjust its position in the world to being a participant in global affairs as opposed to the dominant force 
needs allies and friends and nowhere is that greater than to deal with the question of the rise of Chinese power. Uh, that is posing fundamental questions. We're going to be in a competitive relationship with China for decades and decades and decades to come, as is India. And therefore, the emergence of ways to manage our relations with China, the Quad is an excellent example. I'm very glad that your prime minister, my president, the Australians, Japanese prime ministers have all accepted this emergence of Quad and the cooperative venture, political, military, economic that it provides us at the chief of government, chief of state level is just of extraordinary importance. You mentioned <clears throat> the question of regional security and notably Afghanistan. Touch on that briefly to simply say the die is cast from the American point of view. Our forces will leave, the remaining American forces and NATO will be out by the 11th of September. But that does not mean that the, uh, the crisis in Afghanistan, if you will, the civil war in Afghanistan will come to an end. It won't. The contest will continue. And how we counterbalance uh, the <clears throat> potential misdemeanors of the Taliban is going to be a real challenge. Uh, to India, to the United States, and to other literal states, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, not to mention the Central Asian nations of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, huge challenges in front of us. But I believe it is possible to look to the future. It is important to support the existing constitutional order in Afghanistan materially and politically. And if that doesn't work to make it absolutely clear to the Taliban that there will be no external sucker for a future Afghanistan if they behave in an irresponsible way domestically and internationally. And finally, of course, the threat of war and the continuation of violence cannot be an attractive feature for people struggling to control their country. So I think we have real challenges, real questions of definition in front of us. One thing comes through to me though, that's very clear, is that amidst many other changes, amidst the global shakeup and the power balance, the American relationship with India is emerging as an enormously important factor and that means we have to be careful with each other. We have to listen to each other. We have to solve problems with each other, not just avoid them, our trade issues, for example, but actually sit down and be serious about the relationship that is emerging. It has huge promise, huge potential. It will be important. We need to manage it carefully. Taryn, let me uh, stop there and turn the conversation over to wiser hands my colleague, Ambassador Dashkopta. Amit, would you like to chime in on this and give your perspective on the, the security threat to this region, the emerging challenges because of the health COVID situation and what the whole quad uh, security dialogue means for India and Australia particularly? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tarun. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to listen to Ambassador Wisner because, um, uh, you know, his years of experience, uh, the, the depth and knowledge that he has uh, is something that all of us can draw upon. And, uh, but before I, I, I comment, there is a question I had wanted to ask Ambassador Wisner, which is that, um, Ambassador, when you look back, at your diplomatic years, if, if I could request you to reminisce uh, a bit, if you were to look back, the world as it stood then and the world as it stands today, what would you see as the key and critical differences and challenges, perhaps even opportunities 
Um, I wanted to remove the pandemic from the equation because that's, that's really been an extraordinary aberration. But how do you see the difference from the time uh, that you were in diplomatic service and the way the world is shaped today? That's a fair question and a tough one to answer. Um, but there are many, many changes. You know, I, I reflect on the fact my considerable and advancing age. I was born just on the eve of World War II and I watched my father go to war. Uh, I grew up in a country that faced the consequences of World War II, that is the outbreak of the Cold War. And the challenge we felt at the time that our nation, our allies and friends faced from uh, communism and from the Soviet Union was a matter of existential importance. And it defined American diplomacy. It defined the development of American power. It powered American industrial infrastructural growth. Uh, the Cold War was a seriously defining moment. Uh, that began to change in the subsequent decades, the 1960s and beyond this when I came into government, but it remained a dominant feature of American thinking and American action all the way through uh, the fall, uh, the, the end, <clears throat> the down, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. At which point, the United States, which had had a core set of definitions of what it was about, who its allies and friends were, what its threats were was faced with a substantially new world, a world in which there was no power equal to the United States. We were not uh, fully ready for the challenge. And I admit that uh, even as a diplomat serving at the height of my career, I watched my country rocket between let's pull back from the world or let's engage and insist on a world order that would be dominated by American definition of choices. Uh, that phase, albeit brief, 20 years or so, uh, even less, uh, is clearly over. And the world order has changed yet again. And now we are sitting at, uh, Taran, you use the term Westphalian order. I believe we're at the dawn of a new Westphalian order not the end of an old one. And that is a requirement that major powers, powers around the world, accept the sovereignty and domestic definitions uh, and of each other and agree to stay out of conflict, to balance a predatory behavior, but not try to overwhelm the international system or face a coalition of opposition. So these three changes um, during my lifetime are just absolutely consequential. Cold War to, if you will, American hegemony to the emergence of a Westphalian world. These are huge, huge challenges. And I'm not sure uh, public intellectuals, statesmen, politicians, uh, business communities and others have fully grasped the requirements of adaptation. And then when you layer in climate change, scientific change, you layer in economic change, uh, <clears throat> you uh, create a chessboard with so many different new moves to be played. Uh, we're in for an exciting time. Uh, uh, Ambassador Wisna, since you talked about the, what you call the dawn of a new Westphalian order. Now, as if you follow, if we follow uh, President Biden's foreign policy statement in the last few weeks and his address to Congress, the Indo-Pacific stands at the front and center of American diplomacy. His first multilateral commitment was the Quad Summit with the leaders of, as you pointed out, Japan, Australia, and India. And the first international visits of the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense were to Asia, Japan, South Korea, and India. The Indo-Pacific is going to play a 
crucial role it looks like in the region's security architecture. So how does it relate to what you are talking about, the dawn of a Westphalian, new Westphalian order? And how do you see China fit into that or warding of the Chinese threat to the new order? Could I, could I, I jump in here? Uh, could I jump in yeah. here, Ambassador Wisner? And, and, and also add that um, uh, what I liked very much is that um, to your earlier question, Tarun, um, Ambassador Wisner used the word competitive with regard to China. China. He said competitive China. And I think the perception that China has uh, with regard to the Quad is that it's a combative uh, posturing that's taking place. And somehow negotiating this, uh, we've heard the, the rather tough statement that's been made by the Chinese uh, envoy uh, to, to Bangladesh, uh, and, and, and that, that appeared to be out of line. And even though he, he did argue that uh, he was misquoted, uh, we know that the Chinese send signals in interesting ways. Um, so, so it would be great to hear from Ambassador uh, whether the Indo-Pacific is now part of the new Westphalian architecture, and where would China fit in? Exactly, and these are critical points uh, that we have to address and are in the process of being worked out. But let me make a couple of observations. Uh, Taran's absolutely correct when he says, uh, when he described Biden's foreign policy. But let's remember that Biden's approach to his presidency is driven by the necessity politics, of course, but the necessity to transform, revitalize uh, the United States, to rebuild our society, to re-strengthen our infrastructure, to deal with uh, unmet needs in our society, precisely so that we can meet the requirements of our citizens, but also be a competitive force on the international stage and a trusted uh, factor in international affairs where you can count on the United States to exercise, uh, not only put resources on the table, but to put ideas on the table and stick by them as we change from administration to administration. That's the overall drive of Joe Biden's policy. Inside of that, you're absolutely right second, Tarun, when you say that the focus that Biden would like to give to our foreign policy is to move the, uh, <clears throat> move the gaze from uh, the war on terror, the Middle East, uh, other pressing issues and give Asia the priority that it deserves. Now, he's doing that, but let's also remember when I look at events today in the Middle East, anytime any nation decides it's going to pack up its bags and leave the Middle East, <laughs> Middle East has a terrible habit of reaching out and grabbing us all by the neck and dragging us back in again. True. So there is no policy for it in which you give up responsibilities in one part of the world and move uh, completely to another. But we will deal with the effect of trying to work out ways to balance, to maintain an equilibrium in Asia, to deal with the rise of Chinese power. It's a term I prefer to use. And I believe the core strategy, Ambassador Gupta, is threefold. Number one, where we conclude, particularly in combination with like-minded nations like India, we'll confront. We will sail vessels through the South China Sea. We will stand by India when uh, China overreaches in your mountain fastness. Um, we will confront when necessary. We will compete the second sea. We will compete technologically uh, for seats at the global table at the definition of global rules, we will compete with China 
economically. Uh, so confront, compete, and third, we will cooperate where there are opportunities in climate change or in economic recovery post COVID, there is ample space for cooperation. There's a vital need to work out rules of cooperation in cyberspace and outer space with China. So we should not approach China with one view. It's all uh, confrontational. Uh, it is a three-part approach. And with that in mind, the signal that I believe the United States would like to send to China and that we will find common ground with India is not to call into question China's right to grow its domestic economy, to exercise its responsibilities internationally, but rather that China recognize the limitations that it too seek equilibrium, that it too seek a more stable international order in which each party participates without dominating other parties. And if one party, and in this case, China, uh, threatens the basic order, then other parties will come together and call into question China's moves. Here is exactly the role of the Quad. The Quad is not an alliance. It should not be a formal military and security structure. It needs to be a strong political signal of resolve, signaling to Beijing that if Beijing oversteps, there's a first line of defense of important nations with real effect on the global economy and the global security system. And China needs to calibrate its moves. Of course, China will complain, as you mentioned, the ambassador in ba Bangladesh. But it is be precisely because China recognizes uh, that it must accommodate an expression of serious international intent, which is exactly what the Quad is about. So I'm a big Quad supporter. I believe it gives lots of room for Indian and American cooperation and provides another runway to our relationship, um, strengthening our economic and other ties that exist, ties of population, uh, ties of political uh, ties. This, is, this strategic dimension is the new fact in the Indian-American relationship. Forgive me, Ambassador and Taran, I think I've overspoken my piece. Uh, I think Ambassador, that, just a uh, uh, last question before I think Amit uh, rounds it up. You know, you, we are talking about Quad and all the four countries that are involved in Quad are sticking to the, the terminology. It's uh, nothing more than a security dialogue. And but China sees it very differently. And as you pointed out that, you know, the Chinese ambassador threatened the Bangladesh about joining up Quad and talked about you know unforeseen circumstances uh, you know uh, unforeseen consequences etc now as four countries which are nothing more than a dialogue partners what position can they take when china openly threatens a small country like bangladesh and you know and you yourself have served in dhaka you know that country well what should be the quad's response to this is that question to Ambassador Dashgupta or myself? To you, sir. Yeah. Um, well, I think at the moment, uh, I can't see a threat to Bangladesh from China. Uh, what I see, if I were sitting in Sheikh Hasina's, uh, behind her desk, I see a new set of options. I see the emergence of an arrangement called the Quad, and I see China, and I can navigate between those two shoals. Uh, the Quad is correctly not a, an alliance. It's not a sort of NATO structure with command elements and deployed forces. And in that, its strength lies. Uh, 
It is flexible. It's open to participation from other nations in Southeast Asia. It's open in its activities to participation from European nations, the British and the French, for example, have undertaken to sail through the South China Sea yeah. to assert freedom of navigation. Yeah. The Quad is a flexible arrangement that provides political coordination. And if China seriously oversteps and threatens the order, if China leaves its traditional policy of peace across the uh, straits with Taiwan, or it asserts unilateral control of the South China Sea, or it threatens border areas in the high Himalayas, um, or it presses against Japanese sovereignty in the Senkaku Islands, then we can in the Quad up our game and the machinery exists to consult, to signal. And China is a nation whose ancient habits of statecraft recognize when they face overwhelming and overwhelming counter consensus, they take a step back. Amit, would you like to add to that and round up this discussion? Because I think we are, you know, yeah, I, th I, th I think, you know, I, I think Ambassador Wisna is a very, very wise person and the manner in which he has articulated uh, the state of affairs uh, is, is uh, spot on and I, I couldn't agree with him more. And I also believe that uh, the three C's that he mentioned, uh, particularly with regard to confrontation, competition and cooperation. I think they lie at the court, at the, at the heart of, uh, of a mature foreign policy. And for those who, who would wish to misinterpret this and include a fourth C, uh, containment, and vitiate the atmosphere, I think it doesn't work. Foreign policy doesn't work if you're looking at strategically containing countries. And most certainly it's not going to work with China. And I believe that in the new world order, the, the new Westphalian model that we are looking at, the whole objective needs to be to work with all countries in a manner that, that nourishes and takes forward the global requirements and the global objectives, keeping the future in mind. Today, I know that, um, uh, and Tarun, you may agree with me, uh, that Indian foreign policy has, uh, has, has taken its foot off the pedal uh, with regard to many of the issues that they were earlier involved and engaged with uh, in a strategic manner with great intensity. And that's because of the pandemic. And the pandemic has become a critical pillar of Indian foreign policy because uh, God knows there is an extraordinary amount of suffering that's going on. There is a lack of clarity. The confusion uh, does suggest that this year would again be one of misery and grief. And uh, foreign policy therefore requires that we, we reach out to friends as indeed we did to the United States and to many others, Australia, uh, the UK, Germany. And, and this, this collaboration, this uh, show of hands, this bonding will allow us to, to tide over the storm. But this also means that for the time being, we've uh, not put a pause button, but we have actually uh, withheld full, full-blooded engagement on the multiple other issues that confront the global community. And that having been said, I must confess that every time I speak to Ambassador Frank Wisner, I, I feel all the better for it. And uh, so over to you, Tarun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tarun. Would you let me just yeah, uh, sure. interrupt solely to say? What a pleasure it is to be with all of you, but to join my heartfelt uh, sentiments 
in this ghastly tragedy India is undergoing at the moment, I cannot begin to tell you how deeply moving is India's plight and how all of us feel very much compelled to respond in any way we know. But my sympathies, personal and also on the part of all Americans, for what you're experiencing. Thank uh, you. Ambassador Vishnu, we really appreciate that. And I know how deeply you feel for India, having been served here, not just as ambassador, but um, wearing several other hats. You have been deeply attached to this whole region, and you have been a frequent visitor here. We really appreciate your sentiments. And, and thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts on the pressing issues facing this region. And thank you, Ambassador Dasgupta, for putting this together. And I hope we can do this again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Vinza, once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so well, much. Ambassador.